Hello, welcome to CIS 137 class 8. Programming isn't about what you know, it's about what you can figure out. So this is a book, this is from a book called Learn to Program, written by Chris Pine. We go there. If we go there, uh, may not work here. I don't know what's going on. Uh, it's a book written in like 2006, 2009. Here it is. It seems to be a good intro to computer uh, software. It's written with Ruby. Um, might be a little dated. It was updated in like 2009, uh, but. It has a lot of good reviews, and, and this guy seems to know what he's talking about. So I just like the quote. So it's not about you know; it's about what you can figure out. So just n knowing the the whole uh, framework or language you're working with, it's gonna be pretty impossible. But if you know where to find all that information, then you can figure it out. So just figure it out on the fly. All right. So today we're going to be covering uh, handling, of, handling of events in React, user input in React, and uh, going to introduce the course project part two. So first, in handling, handling events in React, what are events? So HTML events are things that happen to HTML elements. And this is a direct quote from this page here. I just really like the technical explanation. So basically, JavaScript can react to these things that happen. Uh, so what things can happen? Uh, the HTML web page can be. Uh, finish loading and when that happens you know javascript can fire to do something else an html input field could be changed by the user or by something else and uh, javascript can react to that or when a user clicks a button javascript can react to that as well so these are all of events that are uh, attributes on the html element itself so you can see here you could have your element whatever it is it could be an anchor or a div or uh, a span or or any HTML element, and then it would have some event that has a name that would be listed as an attribute. And then in regular HTML, we would have uh, some JavaScript inside of quotes. Generally, you would be calling a JavaScript function. Let's look at this example. So in this example, uh, the button on click event, we'll call this JavaScript where it's, it's getting the demo element and setting the inner HTML to the current date. So the demo element's right here. So we're gonna be filling this in with the current date. So we hit the time is, so our on click event fired and it executed this JavaScript. So now we have this time here. And we can continue to update it. Now here's another example, but it's using this .innerHTML now. So this is going to refer to the button that uh, was clicked. So we're going to replace this text with the date. And then getting closer to React, uh, we're passing a function call to the event. So whenever the event happens, uh, this function call will happen. So the function call right here, the function is defined as document .get element ID by the demo inner HTML equals date. So it's very it's it's the same as the first example, but it's inside of a function. So our demo is down here. We hit it. We get that event. Fired. 
So the list is more here. Uh, on change is another one we're going to use on click. You, know, you can do some hovering stuff with on mouse over, on mouse out. Uh, on key down would be when right here the user pushes a keyboard key. And then on load is another one that's used in JavaScript, but we're not really going to be using this one in uh, React. It's not necessary for us for React. So I recommend trying out these exercises, but ultimately, events in React are a little bit different. So if we saw back here, all these event names are uh, completely lowercase. Well, in in React, it uses camel case instead. So it would be on change with a capital C. So if we wanted to, you know, for instance, change this page to look like we want for React, it would look like this on change. On click would look like. On mouse over, I believe it would even be the M and the O. But let's see. Let's see if that's correct. You may not know that, but we can figure it out. So let's go. Uh, actually, I have a link later. I think. Let's see. Yep, right here. Where are you? Here we are. So that would be a mouse event. On click, on context menu, on double click, on mouse down, on mouse enter, on mouse leave, on mouse over. So that O is capitalized. So every word has a capital letter, just like Campbell case should. Another difference is that in JSX, you pass a function as the event handler rather than a string. That's because uh, you know, in React, our, our JSX is embedded inside of JavaScript, so we can pass JavaScript functions with the curly braces. So for instance, if we had button on click activate lasers, uh, or we had button on click, you know, the same as uh, this right here, if we did this in React instead, here's how it would look. So we're going to go ahead and start with um, this code pin exercise here. Okay, so in this particular example, the on click event is uh, firing this dot handle click. So handle click is setting the uh, is toggle on boolean to the opposite of what it was before. So this is, this is uh, the not operator. So whatever the previous state was not will be set to is toggle on. So it's doing some extra stuff in here. Uh, when you want to use the pre previous state uh, inside of a, a handler like this, it's best to, uh, in your set state, use a callback function to get the previous state instead of using this dot state. Uh, I have an example later that uses this dot state, and we're going to fix it to use this. So I'll show you how that's done. Uh, render. We have this dot handle click, and then we're based on that state. We're going to learn a ternary operator today too. We're going to set the on and off. We'll talk about how this all works later. But pretty much all this does is change the text of the button. But we could rewrite this to 
uh, set the current date instead. Let's try that out. Can I change this this dot set state to or actually let's let's just create a new a new function that is similar to display date. So we make display date. This one we're gonna set the state to have a date. And then instead of having to do set the inner HTML inside there, all we're doing is setting the state, and then we're actually going to do the HTML right here. So we're going to set display date there, and then we're going to put the HTML or the uh, the state in here. With dates, we have to set to two string. So right now the uh, date is empty, so the, our button's completely missing. Use the ternary operator again. Or sorry, no, we're not. We're going to use a default state up here. We're just going to set the date to a. And look, this is not working right now. So one thing you have to do in React when you use uh, these callbacks in event handlers is you have to bind the the callback. You have to bind the function to this. And that's because uh, the way JavaScript works, if we don't bind this, then uh, this gets uh, set as the calling uh, the calling element. So the this right here is actually referring to the button, I believe. So instead, we wanted to this right here to refer to the class that we're in, an instance of the class. So inside the constructor, we're going to Override the function bound to this. So you see now it's all hooked up properly. That's a little uh, annoying thing you have to do. It's a little bit boilerplate-ish, and it's kind of hard to, to debug. We just have to keep in mind that you have to do this binding here in the constructor. There are some experimental ways around it, which we'll talk about later. So I have a, a demo we can go over to look at even more React uh, events here. So we've done the on click operator. Let's check this out. So this is a uh, event handler that uh, listens to the on change event. So when the on change event happens in this checkbox, then this dot handle input change is fired. And in fact, on all of these, uh, on the checkbox and then these two uh, text fields, the on change event is all this dot handle input change. And we're going to go over how this works when we get to the next section. But this basically uh, updates the values or updates the state values based on the uh, whatever value or whatever uh, input field we're changing. I'll explain how this works later. The idea is uh, when the checkbox changes, then it's going to set the state 
of the left side to true or false, depending on if it's checked or not. Then, uh, when the left side changes, we're going to use a ternary operator to determine if uh, which side is the winning value. Well, I'm going to change this one to be like this. The way a ternary operator works is that uh, it checks the left side first, and it checks it for true or false. So if it evaluates to true, then the uh, the value on the left side right here, the value in the middle, really, you have question mark, and the value in the middle will be returned. If the value is false, then the value after the colon, the last value, will be returned. So let's say right here we have value of true and value of false, uh, value of true after the question mark, and then colon value of false. If we change uh, the checkbox state, it shows you which value would be returned. You can change these values inside of here too. So you can play with this, break it, change it. Uh, it has some links in here as well. So if you want to know what true and false means in JavaScript, that's actually a uh, pretty complicated thing in, in JavaScript. It's not super complicated, but the idea is that... Uh, here we go. Zero is false, for example. You know, minus zero is false. The empty string is false. Undefined is false. Null is false, and false is false, non numbers false. But any of these other things, any of the other values are true. So even the string false is true. So if you if you had, for instance, uh, you know, false in here as a string, then it would be true. So this can be kind of annoying because uh, you know you may have a legitimate zero number in there, and it's uh, evaluating the false. So you just have to be careful with how you write these expressions. So uh, the next link shows you how you can write these expressions. Generally, when you're using the on the left side, you usually, uh, I'm using a Boolean variable on mine. So left side is true or false depending on the check state. So if the check state is, you know, for this checkbox is true, then left side is set to true. So uh, if it's not, if it's unchecked, then left side is set to false. So this is just a, a Boolean value here. But if you had a more complex value, like a number, then you'd want to use a comparison operator. So with these, you can have uh, equals and not equals and greater than, less than. And you see in JavaScript, the equals operator uh, has two equal signs uh, for a loose equals. So this this equals will convert strings to numbers for you. So if you wanted to test, you know, if five equals the string of five, you could use double equal sign. Now a more strict equals is the triple equal sign. So this one checks if the value is the same and if the type is the same. So a number can never equal a string with the triple equal sign. And this is actually what you'll see more of in uh, actual JavaScript code is a triple equal sign. Double equal sign is pretty much just too loose. So you can see that up here you say given that x equals 5. Just a single equal sign is the assignment operator. So you don't want to use that for comparisons because uh, it won't work. It's, it's 
it will assign a new value to x. So you have to use at least two equal signs, but really you should be using three equal signs. So you also do not equals, so this exclamation point means not uh, most of the time when we're working with it in, uh, in, in our web development. It's also used for comments in HTML, but in, uh, in React, it means not. And you can do greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, or less than, equal to. Uh, there are ways to combine multiple Boolean expressions together using logical operators. Uh, we're not going to dig too deep into these. These are more of uh, getting into programming. And I'm going to keep that light for this course. Just know they do exist. You can check them out. You can try them out. Uh, but we're going to keep try to keep it pretty simple. So this one is just really a Boolean value that uh, switches which uh, form field, which input, gets the winning value class. And we just look at that class uh, winning value. It just says the border of a five pixel solid green and a six pixel dot yellow outline. Uh, what else is in here? I'm just increasing the font size. Um, I increases the font size of the inputs. And uh, change the size of the text box. And then I just uh, have these links styled so they'll they'll stack on top of each other with some padding. So we're going to go over. Uh, you have some, a lot of new stuff in here, right here. We're actually going to use this example in a second as well. But uh, and we're going to go over these inputs in the next section. But do you guys have any? Uh, questions about first section, actually handling events in React. So there are a ton of events, know where to find them. Uh, in, in the React form right here, you can check this out. Uh, oh, it's all over here, handling events. We can see some simple examples in here. So on click and then in curly braces, you put your function name inside of here. Generally, it's going to be this dot something when you're working with classes, class components. Uh, and when you're using this dot something, if you're using the this keyword inside of that function, you have to make sure you bind it in the constructor. So I can't stress that enough. You got to make sure you bind it in the constructor. Uh, you see right here, they're not binding it in a constructor because uh, they're not using this inside of handle click, so it doesn't even matter. But generally, when you're uh, handling some kind of event on the the on the UI on inside the HJSX, that event will be changing the HTML in some way, and when you want to change the HTML in some way, you change the state. And in order to access the state, you need this. In order to get this, you need to bind this to the function call. So we're doing that inside the constructor here. So after you set the state, then you bind your, your callback functions. So this explains uh, a little bit of why you have to be careful with this. It's just some, how functions work in JavaScript in general. But with the arrow function, uh, if you remember, we talked about the arrow function a little bit. What the arrow function does is that it does not override the binding of this. So the arrow function gets the binding of this from its actual containing uh, class or function. So this inside of this handle click, which equals the arrow function of uh, console.log, and it's just logging this to the console. Uh, this arrow function, the this, refers to the logging button instance we are in. So all we have to do, we don't need to set 
uh, the binding inside the constructor when we use this arrow function, we uh, can just use this dot handle click here. I recommend not doing the thing down here. This is this is not good. This, uh, if you see, it says it, in most cases it's fine, but it it can lead to sticky situations where this callback is created every time the page is rendered, which could lead to uh, potential performance problems. So this kind of assigning the arrow function to the uh, to this property is a, I believe, ES 2016 functionality, which is not officially part of ES 6 at this time, but uh, but it's 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 on its way to being normalized in the ES 7. So these are called class properties transforms right here you see the bound function equals the arrow function return this dot instance property so that's going to equal bork in here create react app uh, when you use that it allows that uh, binding and i think i have a slide about this later but it allows that binding and um but if, you, if you're using something like CodePen, then you can't use this uh, property initializer syntax. Instead, you have to use the binding in the constructor, which is fine. It's just a little bit of a boilerplate maintenance we have to make sure we are aware of. Oh, so the other thing you need to be able to find in here is this synthetic event. So instead of using uh, the HTML events in React, we're using synthetic events, which are, uh, you know, this onClick operator. It's synthetic because instead of being all lowercase, it's using this uppercase C, so it's using camel case. And then the functions get uh, a normalized event as well. So if you want to see what uh, is available in the synthetic event, uh, we're going to go over these a little bit in the next section. The main one we're going to do is prevent default inside of uh, a synthetic event object, but then you also have all the supported events down here. So if you want to see what events you can do depending on you know what happens in the page, so if, for instance, if the user enters some keys, you know you could check if they're entering arrow keys and move a, move elements around the page. You can make a game. Uh, Excuse me. You can do clipboard events, so you can check if uh, copy, cut, paste. So if, if someone's trying to copy something from your page, you can pop something up and say, I see you. Uh, composition events. I don't worry about those right now. Uh, the main ones we're going to focus on are the user initiated events. So it would be if they did something in the clipboard, keyboard, you know, mouse, if they changed focus on elements. There's even touch events now uh, for mobile. So yeah, you can check these all out uh, and try to imagine the, the possibilities of how uh, someone could interact with the page or how the page could you know, notify you of its current state based on these events. All right, so let's jump over to user input in React. So we, we do have a little bit of user input in this ternary operator. You know, we could we can change values here. But it's a lot more uh, involved than that. So when we're dealing with user input, we're actually dealing with uh, forms. So these are, they have the idea of, you know, a form of paper you would get uh, for uh, signing up for something, or the, the idea is that you have a bunch of fields you need to fill out with your information that you then submit to someone else. Uh, you know, you'll see these forms in a lot of web pages, especially things like uh, Facebook, where you have to like sign up for an account. So you have to fill out the form uh, in order to you know create an account. 
or you have to fill out a form in order to post a, a status update, or you have to fill out a form to post a, a tweet. These are uh, these are literally called forms in HTML. So form is the wrapper element around its uh, the child input elements. Uh, it can also contain other elements in there. It doesn't just have to be uh, user input elements. But uh, the user input elements get special treatment inside the form. So when you go to submit a form, we can send the values on to something else. Now, traditional forms, uh, you know, we can have the text input and the radio button and submit button. But traditional forms inside of HTML use this action attribute to indicate which action to, uh, or where to submit the data from the form. But uh, we're going to do it slightly differently in React. I'll show you how in a minute. So the idea is, uh, like we learned the REST API, we have the kit method and the post method. So there are two different ways to send the values from our form. So the get method will send the values as query string parameters. The post method will send the values inside of the uh, the post body. So it'll it'll it uses a form encoding to send the values over to the server. But we don't have to worry about this with React. So on React, we use the on submit event. Add in React to here. So the form in React, uh, we're going to go over that. We're going to go over examples of that in a, in a little bit. But uh, instead of having this action here, we would have it on submit, and we would pass it a a function callback. So just like handling any other uh, event, we just pass a curly brace and then this dot, you know, handle submit or whatever function name we have. And we'll go over that in a minute because it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that because uh, the way we pass the values is, uh, is different. The next thing we're going to look at is this input tag or the input element. So the input element lets the user uh, enter information into the web page. And there's a couple more uh, input elements or form elements that we're going to go over in a second. But the idea behind these input elements is that you could enter text it provides a way to enter text into fields uh, and you do that by specifying the type attribute of the input element. So there's uh, many different types that we can use for input. So a lot of things built in, especially to HTML5. So for instance, we have a password input type. And this is a, the, the classic password box you'll see on your uh, on a lot of websites. So this automatically hides our field or hides our input. It masks it. Another input type is the submit input type. And this is a button that uh, fires the form action or uh, the form on submit event that we're going to be handling in React. So that form uh, gets submitted when you press that button. But it also, uh, when we're typing, if we press enter inside of there, uh, enter will submit the form as well on um, all input elements. All you need for the submit button is the input type submit, 
and then the submit text will be set. You could change the value of the, the text on the button itself. Like you set change it to OK or save uh, just by setting the value here. So you can also have a reset value or reset button uh, that'll set the form values to their default values that are set in, in value. This, this works a little bit differently in React, and we'll go over that later. Radio buttons, uh, they exist. You can use them. We're not too worried about them for this class at this time. Checkboxes, uh, it's just input type checkbox. And then, let's see, HTML5 input types are pretty neat. So HTML5 has a color input type, date, date time local, email, month, number, range, search, tell, telephone, time, URL, or week. So these are more, uh, uh, in traditional HTML4 apps, you would have to create inputs that allowed you to do these things that are built in. But instead, in HTML5, you can do things like fire up a color picker or uh, all right, the color picker is all the way down here. I pull it up, color picker, and then you can actually, you know, select whatever color you want, and it'll get reflected in that picker here. And when you press submit, then it tells you what the color was in hex. Date ones are cool. This is something uh, you'd have to import in from another control for every app back in the day, but now you can have this built-in date picker that, that looks and functions pretty well. Uh, it ex works in the expected fashion. You can press up or down on these fields. So you can adjust the date. And the last one I want to show for now is this email uh, input type. So what's nice about the email input type and, and specifying these HTML5 types is that Mobile web browsers treat these in a special fashion. So when you pull up a keyboard, for example, when you have an email input type, it'll show the at symbol and the dot com uh, symbols to help the user input their email faster. And when you have the telephone input type, for example, input type equals tell, then it'll pop up the, the keypad so you can enter the numbers as if you were dialing a phone number. So, sorry, one second. So using these HTML5 types uh, definitely help out, especially in mobile. And HTML5 has this input type number, which uh, was another annoying thing you would have to do in HTML4, where you had to block uh, letter input. And A, B, C, D, E is a valid thing. A, B, C, D get knocked out. And then you can press up or down to change the number. And this particular input type uh, is forcing a value between 1 and 5. So all this stuff is built into HTML5. It didn't uh, used to be that way. Now in React, uh, we have something called controlled components. So if we go to here, so here's what uh, a form could look like in React. So this is just a plain form that has a label and then an input uh, type text right here inside of the label and input type submit. So the problem with this in a single page architecture is that uh, when this form is submitted, when you press the button to submit it, the, uh, the browser actually will refresh the page. But for uh, single page applications, like the React pages we're working on, 
we want to stay on that page and we just want to handle the form submission in JavaScript. Now we do that with that the on submit event on the form. Uh, but we also have to get the values from our input uh, our input elements. Now instead of uh, in React, the idea is that you don't want to basically have to search the, the DOM, the document object model. You don't want to have to, to query that or scan that uh, like you would in, in something like jQuery. Instead, uh, you're proactively saving the value that the user is typing in to a state variable. So you see the value initially has uh, an empty string as its value in the state. So this is our initial state up here. We do our initial state again in the constructor after we do super props. Then we do our initial state, and then we bind our uh, our callbacks. Now inside of our input on the on change event, whenever this value changes, so if the user presses a single key, we're going to fire our JavaScript to handle that change. Now that change handle, handler should be pretty simple because uh, it has to come back quickly in order to show the user that the uh, the value changed. If we don't have this here, then uh, the value of the input text box will not actually change as the user is typing. So what this is doing is it set it's resetting the state to the current value of uh, the text box here. Then the way React works, you know, once the state changes through the set state, then it re-renders the form. And when it re-renders the form, it displays the current value of this dot state uh, dot value to the text box. So kind of think of this like frames of a movie. It's 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 going to update it as the uh, the on change event is firing. And then uh, the on submit, when we call this dot handle submit, we don't need to query the uh, the elements on the DOM. All we need to do is check the state. So the current state has all the current most current values. So we already have collected the values by the time we get to the handle submit. So we can just say this dot state dot value uh, inside of the handle submit instead of having to say like this dot you know, find element by ID of, you know, input, if this input had an ID. We just already have that built into the uh, state. So we can see, we put our name, then we get an alert. So the handle submit is just popping up an alert. And then it's calling prevent default in order to stop the page from refreshing. So this you'll see in uh, most handle submits, it'll stop the page from refreshing. It'll stop the the form from being you know pushed somewhere else. It'll uh, this is probably the most important part of this event that you'll need for now. So event dot prevent default. You don't need it in the handle change. In fact, you shouldn't have it in the handle change. The only place you should have it is in the uh, the handling of submit. So let's say, for example, we don't have this handle change, or if we just you know got rid of it from right here. Now, when we go to try to change the value, nothing's happening. That's because you know the input text box is bound to the value of this dot state dot value. Now even when we're typing, <coughs> we're not actually changing this dot state dot value. So this dot state dot value is always going to be you know whatever the initial value is here. So we can call this initial if we want, and then it'll pop up down here. But now I cannot change initial at all. 
because whenever I try to make a change, it's just setting it to this dot state dot value. So in order to be able to change the value here, we have to have that on chain handler. Now the handle change will, you know, set the state to the new state, and uh, then it'll re-render the component, and it, then state the value state will have a new value. These names are terrible. Sorry. So this is why it's called a, a controlled component because it's really controlled uh, by react is controlled by the state you know it's not a normal form that you can just you know, plop an input text box down so if we if we didn't have any you know this dot state dot value set in the value you know it would be not controlled by this the react at all anymore it'd just be a normal html element but doing it this way uh our value is always inside the state which is great we can we can do some custom Checking in here, you know, we could even, you know, ensure. Let's say we want to make them all lowercase, no matter what. We could set it. We could transform the input as it's happening. We could filter out, you know, characters that we don't want to allow in the input. We could do all kinds of things on the fly. So it, it gives you a lot of power, but it just gives you uh, some complexity as well because then we have to remember to bind this in the constructor. We have to remember to create the uh, function. We have to remember the event that we're working with, and we have to look at the synthetic event to see what is possible inside the event. Uh, it's definitely more complex, but it is a lot more powerful. So now, we'll, yeah, in the submit, we can just access the state in order to get the values from these fields. So control components, add complexity, sorta, but it's it's a predictable uh, complexity that uh, you know you'll be using throughout. So I went over the experimental property initializer syntax. Don't worry about that. Another type of uh, Input is the select tag, and this is actually, you know, also referred to as drop-down menus. So when you have uh, one of several values you need to pick from, then you would use a select tag. I'm gonna keep this light because I want to get to a demo. But if you look here, we can see the select tag just has a, you know, a select tag at the top with a name, and then you can have several options underneath of it. You know, that contain values. And when you uh, see these, you know, you, you see it as a, you can pick one of these values and then you can submit it. And we see cars has a value of Fiat. That's the one we picked. Uh, in HTML, we if we wanted to set a default selected option, then we would use a selected attribute. That's not true in React. We'll go over what it looks like in React now. So React is slightly different. Uh, they normalize it a bit where, this is annoying. So whenever you click on one of these links, sorry, it's going to have this percent 23. That's a bug in uh, Keynote, I believe. You just have to change back, that back, percent 23 back to a hashtag. OK, so the select tag uh, in React Instead of you know having to select the selected option, you can just select a value, and uh, that value will uh, you can see the, the the handle change right here, setting the value to the uh, select value. And when you select the value here, so the value here, going to automatically select the appropriate option that corresponds to that value. So you don't have to worry about you know, putting a ternary operator on every option, which is the old like jQuery way of doing it. Uh, instead, you can just set the value just like any other input. Text area similar to that. Uh, 
believe it's on this page already. So the text area tag lets you put uh, multi lines of input for the user. Uh, the code here, uh, this is straight HTML where you know the, the content of the text area would be a, inside of the, it would be wrapped around the text area uh, text. But in React, instead of the value being wrapped, with the text area tags, the value is an attribute inside of text area, just like input and just like select. So it's kind of like normal, trying to normalize all these HTML elements, which is kind of cool. Right, so handling multiple inputs. So this is a good description of how to handle multiple inputs in React. So if we click on it, we get this page not found. Just have to replace this percent twenty three. Gosh, so they're just encoding things wrong in the URL. So when you want to handle multiple inputs, you could use this handle input change that worked for across all. Uh, which is it all? I think it might work across all input elements. So uh, what it does here is if the you know, type of input is a checkbox. Then it uses target.checked because checkboxes don't use the target value. Uh, otherwise, it uses target.value for all the other cases. And then it, it grabs the name from this name attribute on the uh, element. So you have to remember to, to write this name, and this name has to match the state variable name. A little bit more boilerplate here, so it can get a little crowded. So we have this, this boilerplate here where you have to bind this. And then this is boilerplate where we have to set the name of the input to the, uh, the state name. Now you don't have to do it this way. You could create like a, a separate change handler for every input if you want. But this is just you know, a convenience method to, to have a, uh, a quick way of handling things. And you can basically copy and paste and drop this in, the, in your code. and I'll show you how that works in a second. Uh, so yeah, we have the is going and number of guests. Uh, birth controlled components, they're controlled by the state. They uh, have the same on change handler. So uh, based on the name, we're setting the state value for that name to the value. So this is a special thing in ES6 called uh, computed property names. So computer property names, computer property names let you uh, surround the property name with uh, these brackets, and uh, it'll it'll set the state properly for that particular you know, number of guests. String will do the state for the number of guests. So this is very similar in uh, pre ES6 to accessing a property uh, using these array brackets. So completely understanding how this works uh, might be a little challenging at first, but knowing that it works might be good enough for now. So let's go ahead to this demo. So handling form input. So this is uh, creating a, a comment section in a website. So the idea is you would have this uh, inside the comment section. So let's get it down here. So this, this uh, particular example has been broken down into components um, in order to show you uh, proper or ways or possible ways you could you know, break down your your uh, components into smaller components so that you can reuse them later or you make your code a little bit more readable. Uh, and, you know, opinionatedly readable. Okay. So the comment section is going to uh, follow a pattern where it calls constructor or has the constructor method. It calls super props. It sets the initial state. So there's the author, the comments, and then the posts. And you can't beat the firster because it's built into the default post. 
So we're creating an array to hold all of the posts here. Now we're binding our callbacks here. So we have a handle input change and a handle submit. Handle input change is directly off of the uh, example from uh, handling multiple inputs. So that's a uh, good way of handling multiple inputs. Uh, the handle submits uh, calls the perfect default first, and then it creates a uh, new post. It's an awesome comment. This is using thread operator. You can see the spread operator as uh, this state has a author and a comment field. If we use the spread operator in this way, if we have the you know concert right here and then the curve braces are the properties we want to extract from this state, and these two values will uh, become regular variables that have values pulled out of this dot state. This is this is the same as saying you know const author equals this state dot author or con comment equals this dot state dot comment. Using this put operator we can do these two lines with these repeated things author author comment comment into one line. So whatever you're comfortable with. Then down here we're using the uh, reason number ES6 feature where if you have a variable name with the same name as a property, uh, then it will it's, it's shorthand to allow you to uh, you know, just put the variable name in there. So for instance, we could just have author is author and comment is comment. Since these two match right here, we can just get rid of this, and it will uh, it, the shorthand will automatically export it out, and you don't have to worry about it. So we have our author comment, and then we're setting a date for the posting date. So this should be a new date. Uh, and then down here, we're refreshing or resetting the state automatically, and then we're adding the post to the beginning of the post. So here's another little ES6 goodie here. So this is the, uh, what is this operator? I can't even, I don't even know what it's called right now. This might be called the spread operator. Uh, what this is doing is it's saying, I want to uh, create a new array and the first element will be a post that we constructed here. And then the rest of the elements will be the, uh, the existing posts uh, but broken up into pieces, you know, instead of having the whole array be the next element, we're going to put, we're going to break it that array out into all of its little posts, and then make each of those an element inside of this array. I mean, this uh, if we saw earlier, this is based on the previous state. So technically, with uh, something like this, we should have the pre-state. We should use that instead of this dot state. That's a quick fix. Um, so let's see if it works. And then, uh, so we'll go down this post form in a second, but uh, we'll just put it in a comment. And then hit submit. So now we add it to our post uh, inside of our handle submit. We put it at the beginning, so you see it, it added it to the beginning, and we kept the previous state's post as well. So our post form is another component. It has uh, several properties inside of it. So these properties are all controlled by this comment section. So the currency of the author, the comment, the handle submit, and the handle input change are all done uh, are all done within this comment section. Looks like we have an error here, so it's distracted. Unexpected token, colon, great, 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 great. So I broke something here. I'm switch it back to what it was. 
it worked. It might have some edge case bugs, but we'll just keep it like that until I figure out what's what was wrong with it. That's what it is, I think. Yeah, okay. That was, yeah, I can fix that. Let's let's refix it. Pre state equals arrow. And then uh in curly braces, we actually have to do turn curly braces. So those curly braces were supposed to be around the object. Uh, they're also supposed to be around the JavaScript code. We're going to change the JavaScript code to uh, return an object. All right, that's what it was. Okay. So, so that's another common thing in programming. When you go to fix something or make it better, it's generally when you you produce bugs like that. So, I. Uh, awesome debugging process. Okay. Post form and the post list. So the post form is all this right here. And the post list is down here. And I originally, you know, wrote the post form inside of here and then I just pulled it out into a stateless functional component. So the post form is now just a stateless functional component that has on submit and it uses props.on submit because the the on submit is being passed to the on submit prop here. Uh, and then it is, it has this input element, this text area element, and then it's using input group. Now, input group is up here. All this does is it wraps each uh, input with a label. So, just like that uh, example from React, which shows the label text if the label text exists. And it puts all the children in here as well. So the children are going to be this input element. Uh, so input elements, you know, props.author is the value that it's going to be set to. Props.handle input change is the callback it's going to call. So these exist in the parent element, this, this content comment section. The handle input change and handle submit. They're just being passed to this component through the props. Now, this is going to be a little bit mind-bendy when you first look at it, but I, I really uh, I want you guys to be able to, to create uh, these broken-down components like this, especially for your project, which uh, this, is, this is bleeding into. Uh, so, so take your time and really try to understand what's going on here and try to recreate something like this. And when you go to your project, you're going to be breaking down your project similarly. We have our input group. Uh, we're rendering the children as well. So anything inside, inside the input group is going to get rendered to the screen. Um, our submit button here. And that's all of the post form. Now the post list, which is right here, this contains the, a formatted uh, uh, form, basically. So the post list is bound to this.state.posts, which is the array of posts. So if we go up to the post list, it is right here. So this post list, I got a little fancy with it. I'm using uh, an arrow function instead of the, uh, the regular function declaration. And that's just to show you how simple a component could be. So this component uh, is using the arrow function to keep it on one line, and it's just wrapping uh, it's using a div wrapper around the props.post.map. And then uh, the map function, like we learned from last class, is transforming each of these posts into a post item. So this is a, a, a pretty dense component. There's a lot going on, but it's still pretty simple. If you follow this pattern, uh, you know, it doesn't have very much complexity in here. The most complex thing is this map. Uh, you can see we're just wrapping the the map uh, results uh, with a div. 
and we're using arrow functions. So it, it's just it's just neat that we can write an entire component on one line without too much complexity. So each post item will use this uh, function, the stateless functional component. It'll pull the post out of the props. You know, this is the same as saying const post equals props dot post, but just slightly less typing. That's how you would traditionally do it pre-ES6. Uh, but you know, if you have this cool operator, why not use it, right? Maybe some typing. Uh, and then this is just returning a, uh, a div with a class of post that has a header and an article. Then in CSS, we're doing all kinds of formatting that I recommend you check out and uh, play with. You know, you could change the background color of the post headers to something else, like blue or orange or, you know, like hash AA233. I don't know what else we got here. Let's put a 1-1 one, one here. There we go. It's like burgundy. OK. And that's it. So that post item gets returned to post list, uh, you know, each post, and and we're done. So we broke it down to components. You know, ultimately, none of these components is really that complex. The most complex one is the comment section because it's doing all the uh, the handling of the changes and the handling of submit, and it's basically passing the information from the post form. To the post list by you know basically being the parent and just you know it has the posts in the state so you just manage the state and uh, all the ele other elements will get updated. So it's a really neat way of thinking things. It's a, it's a mind bendy thing, a mind bendy way of thinking of things uh, at first, but then it becomes clean that you can really componentize these things and then you can have you know container components that you know control all these. Uh, other components with uh, via the state of the container component and then passing it to the props of the child component. So whenever we want to uh, create a new comment, it just works. Now these aren't being saved to a server anymore. That would be a, uh, another topic for another day. So whenever we refresh this page, all these comments are lost. It's probably a good thing. All right, so we went way over time for that section, but it bleeds into the course project part two. Anyone have any questions, by the way? So if you have any questions during the class, feel free to, to you know, either type it out or you know, fire up your mic and jump in. OK, so course project part two. So you should use your existing course project part one as a I have starting guide. It should be a starting point. A starting point, or you can just rewrite it completely from scratch. I mean, once you, you know, now you have more knowledge, it might make sense to, you know, you might have made some mistakes or, you know, made some assumptions in the previous, uh, the previous project that you just want to, you know, toss it and start over. So if you want to restart, you can also use my code as a starting project. Uh, but you must customize your company. You can't use the Sullivan and Height Swim Club content uh, or styling. You got to customize it to, to look like what you want. You know, it has to be uh, unique. So the idea behind this course project part two is that you're going to flesh out the site a bit. So we're going to add three pages of content. It's going to be the home, the about page, and um, the events page. These are going to be expressed as routes in React Router. Um, and you're going to break them down into their relevant components. The home route. So the home uh, is also known as the root or you know just slash. So uh, just slash. You know, for wschools.com slash, this is the home. You know, we don't have to say slash 
Chrome team here. As it doesn't even exist. You know, it's probably index HTML. Index HTML. Or I can't read it. I don't even know what it is. Whatever it is, home is just slash. And usually uh, the browser will just get rid of the slash at the end because it's, the trailing slash is not needed. Uh, but for our, our routing purposes, React Router, it will be that path will be represented by the slash. So the page will show the hours of operation in the session, must show some welcome paragraphs. Uh, the welcome paragraphs, you don't have to use uh, actual text if you can't find it, or if you can't go to some welcome text, don't let that slow you down. Uh, generally, in web development, if uh, you are you're struggling, if you just want some text to filler that looks like text, you know, instead of typing text, 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 text. My mic's not coming in. Okay, hold on. Unplug it and plug it back in. Can you hear me now? I think I was having some network issues there. Sorry about that. OK, cool. All right, so what I was saying. So instead of, for the welcome uh, text paragraph, instead of using, if you, if, you, if you can't think of text for it, you can use lorem ipsum. And this is uh, a text format that just is, is dummy text. It just looks like. Uh, looks like this and this. It just it it's not, you know, it's Latin and it just looks like a paragraph. So you, your your eye won't get distracted by you know repeated word or something like that. Uh, so you could create it here with this lipsum.com, or you can use bacon lipsum, which I like. I'm sorry, not bacon lipsum, bacon ipsum. Uh, so you can do meat, all meat, or meat and filler, and you can make it spicy. Give me bacon. I used it earlier in this course. So we have spicy jalapeno bacon ipsum. And uh, and this still works just as well as regular lorem ipsum, so. But it's more meaty, meatier, so nothing wrong with that. If you're a vegetarian, you know, you can just use a regular lorem ipsum if you want. Uh, so we should have welcome paragraphs, uh, membership costs in some fashion, and then at least three images in addition to the existing hero header. So however, however you want to do these images, I'm fine with. Uh, you know, if you want like a row of three, you know, or if you want them like embedded in the text, uh, however you want to do it, it's fine. Just three images enticing people to pay your membership costs. Next, you're going to have the about route. Uh, this is going to have a paragraph describing the history of the, the membership, whatever it is, uh, and then a list of board members. So these could be like a horizontal list or a vertical list. But you would show at least three board members or staff bios that would be formatted on cards. So cards uh, are not an official HTML thing. But you see, for instance, right here, this this is more like a material design thing, which is Google. We'll get into that later, perhaps. But the uh, the idea is that it looks like a card. So the content, you know, if we had uh, a face here and then some, you know, text about who that person is, you know, maybe their name and their title, that'd be good enough for a bio card. And then you just have three of those repeated. You see these cards generally have uh, like a like a shadow underneath of them. Um, 
even this one right here has a shadow underneath. Uh, you can do that pretty easily with the CSS. Uh, let's see, shadows. So the box shadow in here. So you can go here and you can look at these ones. Uh, you know, text shadows. Text shadows are okay. But they, we don't need those. What we need down here are these box shadows. So this is a card right here. This looks fine. You know, this is a card here with a gray shadow. This one's blurred. It's looking more like a real shadow. And then you have this one down here that's like uh, a real looking card. So we want to see a text card or an image card. We can just check it out. And we could just use this text here. You know, we could use this. Uh, these styles and then we can start here and then change things up to be how we want or we could just use this as a reference uh, so again you can you can play with things here you can say like font weight i want it to be bold i would change that text down here to bold okay so you have to show at least three of those they have to be formatted on cards and they have to have images on them The events route. So for the events route, we're going to show uh, a list of um, a list of upcoming events or events for the summer, or, or however you want to do the events. So each event should have string values for at least the time, the title, and description. So I'm going to emphasize that you should use a string value for the time. Don't try to use a date at this time. Um, like the actual date object, that can lead to a little bit more complication than I want right now. Um, it may be involved in Course Project Part 3 if you want to dabble in it, but it might slow you down in this project, which uh, is unnecessary. So for the time, you could just literally put, you know, uh, July 4th at you know 2 p.m. Uh, that would be the time string. So it would be those words, July 4th at 2 p.m. And then you just have to display that straight string in the list. So you're expected to use the map function for at least this events route to display the event cards in a list. I mean, if you if you can use the map function in other places, for instance, uh, using it for the, the board members or staff bios, that'd be good. Uh, I'm not going to explicitly require that. So in addition to those requirements, you need to use React Router to perform the routing. So it must be a single page app. So uh, you shouldn't have like a, an about.html or um, an events.html. But you would have like an about component and an events component. Um, but those are JavaScript files. Those are not HTML files. So single page just means it, it could have multiple components. It can have multiple JavaScript files. Uh, but it only has one HTML file, and that's index.html. All styles must be specified within CSS files. So do not use inline styles. Inline styles uh, are uh, an attribute, the style attribute you can add to an HTML element. Uh, for this particular project, I want you to do everything in CSS. And that's because inline styles are some quirks with them for React. Uh, I don't want you to get bogged down in those, and I want you to learn more vanilla CSS. So, uh, in real-world projects, you know you may use inline styles or whatever, but this for this project, no styles inside the JSX. Just you have to use class names inside the JSX, and then uh, set the styles up in the CSS file. So I really recommend you to experiment with styles. If you have no style on the page, if it looks humdrum, it's going to be a, a lot worse than uh, having like a wacky style that you know may not make perfect web design sense. But at least you're trying the style elements. If if it if all I'm looking for really is an experimentation with the style elements. If if uh, if it doesn't look good, don't worry about it. It doesn't have to look perfect, but just you know, show that you're trying out different CSS styles and you're 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 trying to make it look good, uh, or trying to you know make it look consistent at least. Um, 
but I'm not looking for you know web design perfection at this point. But try, try. <laughs> I encourage you to try. Don't just make it wacky on purpose. That, but if it ends up looking wacky, that's fine. And if it's wacky on purpose but still looks good, then that'd be amazing. That's, uh, I would like to see that. So keep the JSX as simple as possible. So what does that mean? That means don't have more than a couple layers of nesting of elements. Uh, if you have a couple more, couple more than a couple layers, then break that down into uh, reusable components. So you can literally extract that uh, HTML you're writing, uh, or sorry, all that, JS, that nested JSX into a stateless functional component and uh, pass over whatever props it needs and then fill those props and end up on the stateless functional component. So just like you saw for um, that demo handling form input, we really broke this down into um, components. So there's no real nesting in here other than the most nesting you get is inside the post form. But uh, I reduced the complexity of that post form by making this input group. It may look a little bit more complex at first, but you know this, this was uglier earlier. So this input group uh, simplified this reusable thing I was doing. I just, I was just kept on doing it. So uh, it, whenever you're copying and pasting in, in when you're coding, that's really bad. So instead of copy and paste, copy and paste is a, an error. Uh, instead, you should be thinking, how can I create a reusable component? Since I'm reusing this code, how can I wrap it up in a reusable way? So this is uh, the reusable way here. So it wraps the children in the label. Again, let me explain this again. Uh, and then it, if the props label text, so what this is saying is if the props label text exists, then I'm going to uh, display this element. So this is using this and and operator in a special way. Um, and it's similar to a ternary operator. But basically, what it's saying, if the left side is true, then uh, render the right side. Otherwise, it doesn't render anything. Or maybe it renders false. To try that, <laughs> so this may this may have a bug in it. So, for instance, if I got rid of this label text here, then it shows nothing. Okay, good. It worked. It worked. No bug. Always have to do a sanity check like that. All right. So use stateless functional components when you can. Keep JSX as simple as possible. CSS in file in the CSS files. Uh, breaking your your components up into separate files, like actual JavaScript files, is optional. And I'm going to show you next class how to do that because uh, when you use separate JS files, you know here we we just have we declared the comments section, we declared the post list, so we're allowed to use the post list down. Uh, inside of our JSX because it exists in this scope. But if it's in a separate file, it's going to be in a different scope, and you have to actually import the uh, component over from that file. Um, that process, I'll go over next class. So, so when, you, when you import you know, from the file, that file has to export something as well. So it's, it's like uh, you have to set all that up, and it, it's not. It's not too hard, but it's it's something you need to remember. It's something you need to know. Uh, so feel free to just put all your components in you know app.js for now, and uh, we can break them out later pretty easily. In fact, uh, there may be a way to do it in a built-in fashion in WebStorm. We'll see. I hope there is. There might not be, but um, so upcoming due date. So course project part two is due. Uh, Friday, July seventh, by eight a.m. So that's next Friday. It's not. There's not much time. Um, is it next Friday? Make sure of that. Yeah. So it's like ten days away. Uh, so don't waste time. Um, make sure you get this started soon. 
Uh, and if it'll be great at 8 a.m. just like normal um, or sometime near after 8 a.m. If you want to schedule a time for, for grading so you can, uh, where I will screencast or you can screencast and demo it to me um, and I can help with any last minute bugs you're having or anything, then you can schedule that with me. Just hit me up on Slack. All right. Uh, other than that, I think that's good for now. And this weekend is... Uh, next week is July 4th, so uh, I'll see you all before that. Um, otherwise, have a good weekend and, and start working on your projects. Uh, there's not much time. Get it done. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll see you all on Monday morning. Have a good weekend.